In this lecture, we're going to look at one more fundamental theorem, which is the divergence theorem. First, let's refresh our memories of what the divergence of a vector field is computationally and what it's measuring. So given any vector field, whether it's an R2, R3, what have you, you can compute its divergence. And what we do is we, we think of that as the dot product of ddx, ddy, ddz, those differential operators, and the vector field, which for a vector field in R3 written as pqr would just be dpdx plus dqdy plus drdz. What this is measuring is the tendency of the vector field to expand versus contract or stay the same. So in particular, if you imagine your vector field is modeling a gas, is it expanding? Is it contracting? If the divergence of the vector field is positive, then we would observe expansion. If it's negative, it would look like compression. And if the divergence of a vector field is always zero, then we say that vector field is incompressible. We wouldn't see either change. Okay, now we can state divergence theorem. Let E be a solid region in R3 with a piecewise smooth orientable boundary surface S oriented with outward pointing normal vector. Let F be a vector field in R3, which is a nice continuously differentiable vector field. I will say more about S and E in a second, but the flux of S across the boundary surface S enclosing the solid region E is equal to the triple integral of the divergence of F over E. Here the domain and the dimensions are different than what we saw for say Green's theorem and Stokes theorem. E is a solid region. So if we were looking at this picture, looks kind of like a rock, it's not just the edge, it's also the interior. So it's a solid three-dimensional blob. You can travel through it. S is the edge. So S is what is enclosing E. E is three-dimensional, so its boundary here is like this two-dimensional surface enclosing E. It'd actually be easiest if this was a solid, a solid ball. So E could be a solid ball. The boundary surface S is the sphere enclosing the ball. So in the picture on the top right, if this were a solid torus, Say this is like a glazed donut. E is the, the entire donut, including the bread. S is just the glaze. So if E were the solid cylinder, it would be like a filled in cylinder. S is just the shell on the outside. It's just the cylinder. Careful here because S has to entirely enclose E. So you wouldn't just say it's this side. It's also the upper lid and the lower lid. Or E could be the region, say, between these concentric spheres. So it's this filled in region. In which case, S has two pieces. It's the outer sphere and the inner sphere. So there are no real boundary curves here because S needs to be enclosing E. Just like with the cylinder that I pointed out in the bottom left, you don't want to leave any like gaping sides. You would have to say that S bounding this region is, is the top lid, bottom lid, and the sides of this can. This were like a can of soup. For this region E, the orientation is simple. We have orthogonal vectors, they point out. Okay, so for this rock in the top left, it would just be just pointing out. Same thing for this torus, it points out. When you're kind of around the inner hole, you might think of that as pointing into the hole, but it's pointing out of the torus. For the cylinder, we'd have sort of three regions pointing out of the top lid, pointing out of the lower lid, and pointing out of the side. And then for these concentric spheres, the outside one, it just looks like it's pointing out. Again, for the inside one, you might think of this as pointing in somehow, but it's pointing out of the region E. So if E is the blob enclosed between these two spheres, this innermost vector I've drawn is pointing out of E. Okay, so that's the inner orientation, and where do we need that? We need that for the flux integral on the left. Mention here that this is how we've always written these flux integrals. But you also might encounter this notation, it's kind of fancier looking flux integral. It's still a flux integral, but this is kind of reminding you of circulation integrals, emphasizing here that S is bounding a region. So we're really going around a region. You can use either in this context. As usual, what we're equating has a physical interpretation. On the left, that's the divergence of F across E. 
So in other words, on the left, we're measuring the total expansion or contraction across the solid domain E. On the right, this is a flux integral. So if S is like a permeable membrane enclosing E, we're measuring if F is fluxing out or in across that boundary. Again, these two sides make sense together. So it's like if you want to add up whether or not your gas is expanding across the entire region, you can just check how it's behaving on the boundary. Is it sort of expanding across the boundary? Is it contracting inward? Those two notions are going to be the same. Okay, we're going to do a couple examples. The first one, we're going to compute the flux of a vector field across just the cylinder that we're looking at. X squared plus Y squared equals 9 for Z values going from 0 to 5. So I'm going to do a divergence calculation here ultimately, but it's going to be a little bit different than just showing that the two sides of the equality are the same. So we'll break this down in pieces, but the first part is just to compute this flux integral. This is a flux integral, so we need to parametrize the cylinder. We need to do F of R of U and V. We need to compute R sub U and R sub V, take their cross product and check the orientation, and then we need to set up the surface integral in a way that we can actually compute by hand. Okay, so here's our parametrization for the cylinder. R of u and v equals 3 cosine u, 3 sine u, and then v. It's not a solid cylinder. Every xy coordinate on the cylinder lives on the circle of radius 3 in the xy plane. So that's why it's just plain old 3 and then cosine u, sine u. So for x and y, we just need to give the angle. And then v is just representing the z coordinate here. Z is just going from 0 to 5. F of R of U and V, we just plug that into our vector field. So it's X plus Y, 3 cosine U plus 3 sine U, Y plus Z, so 3 sine U plus V, and then Z plus 3X squared is actually going to be V plus 3 cubed, so 27 cosine squared U. Then we need RU and RV. For RU, it's negative 3 sine U, 3 cosine U, 0. RV is even better at 0, 0, 1. Got to take their cross product. When you do that, RU cross RV is 3 cosine U, 3 sine U, 0. That third coordinate should make sense because if you imagine an outward pointing normal vector here, it's going to be parallel to the XY plane. This is a cylinder whose central axis is the Z axis, so it's not going to point up or down the Z axis, so that third coordinate really should be 0. Question is, are we actually pointing out or in? We're pointing out this is correctly oriented. If you don't see it, you could pick values for u and just check them. Check how that vector is pointing for specific values of u. Or you can realize, hey, this is just the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate. In other words, it's, it's the position vector from the origin out to the x-coordinate, y-coordinate, so namely that goes out. Next step is to set up our integral. So this flux integral is now going to be a double integral. 0 to 2 pi for u, 0 to 5 for v, f of r of u and v, that's what we computed in step 2, dot what we computed in step 3, that cross product, dv du. Looks like a big computation, but it is doable by hand. And notice the third coordinate is going to get uh, multiplied with 0, so that's fortunate. So you take it a little further, I'm going to pull the 3 out of the second vector, put that in front. And we get this after doing the dot product. So it's 3 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 5. 3 cosine squared u, I have a 3 sine squared u, so that's overall just going to be 3. And then plus 3 sine u cosine u, plus v sine u dv du. I don't have a lot of v dependence here, I only see that in the last term. I already spotted 3 cosine squared plus 3 sine squared, that's going to be simplified. And then actually since we're integrating from 0 to 2 pi, the sine u cosine u is going to integrate to 0, as is the sine u in the final term. We have some full periods there. The total area under the curve for both of those expressions would be 0 if we go from 0 to 2 pi. So we're left with something that's really not too bad. It's 3 times the double integral from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 5, 3 dv du. This is actually now just a volume computation. So that's 9 times 2 pi times 5, or 90 pi. OK, so the flux of a vector field out of the cylinder is 90 pi. At the moment, this has not been set up in a way that immediately lends itself to the divergence theorem, but let me show you how we're going to apply the divergence theorem in this context. I would like to recompute the flux integral, but this time, instead of computing that flux integral where we just got 90 pi directly, 
I'm going to set this up as a divergence theorem problem. The result is not going to be a computation which in this particular example is significantly easier than what we just did, but there are instances in life where setting a problem up this way rather than by doing the flux integral directly could be advantageous. Okay, so what I'm going to realize is that this cylinder, as drawn with this outward pointing normal, does not enclose a region as in the language of divergence theorem, but if I add to it a top and bottom lid, now I'm actually enclosing a solid region in R3. So I'll call the top lid L1, lid 1, and its outward normal vector would just point straight up, and I'm just going to mention that the unit length version of that vector is 0, 0, 1. The bottom lid we'll call L2. For the divergence theorem, we need that vector to point out of L2, and again, the unit length version of that vector would be 0, 0, negative 1. Okay, now this solid region we're enclosing, let's call it E. E is being bounded by S, that was our original domain of integration, together with the upper lid and the lower lid. So here I've already written the equation that we would use to solve for the flux integral of 90 pi that we found a second ago. But uh, let me explain this in terms of the divergence theorem. If I added the two lid terms to the other side, we would be saying the divergence of F across E is equal to the flux of S across the boundary of E, where I would just do that piece by piece because we have a piecewise description for this boundary. So the flux across L1 plus the flux across L2 plus the flux across S is the divergence of F across E, because together they're enclosing E. But we were actually just trying to compute the flux across S, so let's isolate that. That's what I've done here. And now we just need to set up and solve these three integrals. The first one is easy. The divergence of this vector field is actually just 3, so it's going to be 3 times the volume of the cylinder. And then for L1 and L2, I'm going to use an alternative form for the vector surface integral, which I mentioned when we looked at vector surface integrals. I didn't dig too much into it. And that is f dot d vector s can also be computed as f dot a unit normal vector ds, where now this is a scalar surface integral. This change is not obligatory for this problem. You don't have to do this. I just like this change, though, because it's so easy to write down n1 and n2, since they're pointing straight up and straight down. OK, so let's keep going. The first integral is 3 times the volume of e. That's just a cylinder. For the second integral, n1 is the vector 0, 0, 1. When I dot that vector with f, I'm just extracting the third component. So that's z plus 3x squared ds. This is a scalar surface integral, where the scalar quantity that we're integrating over L1 is just the quantity z plus 3x squared. And exactly the same idea for the second one, except that we're dotting it with a vector 0, 0, negative 1. So that scalar integram would be negative z minus 3x squared. We're going to do the scalar surface integral of that over L2. Okay, the first one's basically done. For these, we have to parametrize L1 and L2. They're not too bad, especially because the z coordinates are constant. So for the first one, we're going to parametrize x and y is living in a disk. z is a constant 5. We do our ru and rv vectors. As expected, the cross product is 0, 0, something, because the orthogonal vector is parallel to the z-axis. For scalar surface integral, we don't care about orientation. We just want the length of that cross product, and the length is u. We have almost exactly the same story for the other lid, except for the z-coordinate is 0. But we get the exact same ru and rv vectors. So we get the same cross product with the same length of u. OK, now I'm out of room, so let me erase most of this. OK, here's where we left off. I now have parametric descriptions and everything I need to set up the scalar surface integrals for the first lid and the second lid. Let me take that second one and distribute the negative so overall this turns positive. The volume of the cylinder is pi times the radius squared times the height. So this is going to be 3 pi times 3 squared times 5, the height of 5. For the first scalar surface integral, it's going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi. 0 to 3, z on that lid is 5, 
And then for our parametrization, x was u cosine v. So it's going to be 5 plus 3u squared cosine squared v. And then times the length of the cross product r1u cross r1v, and that was just u, du dv. The next one is very similar, except for the z coordinate is 0, and that's really it. So now when you look at these two double integrals, they're just plain double integrals now. We actually get some really nice cancellation. So this whole second part basically has gone away and we're left with 135 pi minus five times the integral from zero to two pi of one dv times the integral from zero to three of u du. Go ahead and anti-differentiate. We get the 135 pi minus five times two pi times u squared over two, evaluate at three, subtract off plugging in zeros, cancel out those twos. And so overall we get 135 pi minus 45 pi, which is 90 pi, which is what we already computed. So that's how you can do this flux integral using the divergence theorem. It was not significantly better than doing the flux integral. If it was better at all, it's kind of up to you. I do like how simple the lids were to describe. We had nice orthogonal vectors. We had a lot of cancellation here. Sometimes setting up a problem this way is better, but mainly you see the two sides of divergence theorem being computed here. Okay, let's end with this example. We would like to compute the flux of this vector field. So here our vector field is this entire expression, 3x plus y squared cosine z, 2y minus e to the xz plus z cubed, x to the fifth y to the third power, we want to compute the flux of that vector field across the unit sphere oriented with outward pointing normal vector. This is just written as a flux problem, but the sphere encloses a solid region, so we can recast this using the divergence theorem. So in particular, we can say this flux integral could be computed as the triple integral of the divergence of this vector field across the solid ball of radius 1. You compute the divergence of that vector field. I did this on purpose so that the divergence is constant. It's 5. So overall, this is 5 times the volume of that solid ball. So it's 5 times 4 thirds pi times 1 cubed, or in other words, it's 20 pi over 3. So here's where you would obviously want to use the divergence theorem. Okay, that concludes our examples for the divergence theorem. I'm going to end by mentioning that once again, this is a fundamental theorem. We're going from integrating something that looks like a derivative across a region to computing just something about f around the boundary. So try to tie together these notions that we saw with Green's, Stokes, Divergence Theorem, also the Fundamental Theorem of Line Integration, and you can also go back to the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. They're all giving us a way to pass from doing an integral over some sort of domain to doing a different computation on the boundary of that domain. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Thank you for your attention.